Live from the JSA Podcast Studio, presenting Data Movers, showcasing the leaders behind the headlines in the telecom and data center infrastructure industry. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Data Movers. I'm your host, Jamie Scott Okataya, CEO and founder of JSA, along with my fabulous co-host, as always, top B2B social media influencer, Mr. Evan Christel. Good morning, Evan. Good morning. And hey, everyone. Thanks to Data Movers, where we sit down with the most influential men and women of today's leading telco and data center world, supporting the network infrastructure requirements of this new normal. Good morning, Jamie. So have you uh, have you seen the news about uh, cryptocurrency lately? Yeah, you kind of took a hit, huh, my friend? What's going on? Well, how much money did you lose, if you, if you can tell us? I I never did Bitcoin. I, I am a Bitcoin uh, nervous nilly. Is that a thing? <laughs> uh, no, but we do, we do have a new phrase now. I love it. So yeah, I lost about a third of my crypto holdings, oh. which, you know, I was planning on for retirement, but that's okay. We'll, uh, oh. we'll recover. So there is a great buying opportunity now for the latest coin on the block. It's Evan Kerstell's own B2B coin. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh... <laughs> you sound skeptical. You sound a little... for going? once. I'm actually not even joking. So I'm, I'm... Uh, partnering with Rally Rally IO. They're an address and Horowitz backed uh, company, oh. uh, creating virtual currencies for creators and influencers. And so I have a coin called B two B that allows me to kind of uh, reward and gamify and incentivize uh, my audience. And in turn, they can hold uh, B2B coin and it's going cheap. So, you know, take those dollars you were gonna put into Bitcoin and get a real cryptocurrency. Hmm. Interesting. Well, <laughs> you sound dubious, <laughs> skeptical to say the least. So I know, why don't I we- just- I, you know, and, and hey, we've been doing it for years with credit cards, right? Like, you know, uh, just calling something value and, 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 uh, and therefore it is and, and getting things in return. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a great philosophy. I just, I, um, oh gosh, I just, what, what happens in the day the SEC is like, yeah, no, like, what do we do then? Yeah, then we're all as they say, royally screwed. But in any case, let, let's talk about the, the real world of technology yeah. and data centers. And it looks like we have a great guest. Oh my gosh, one of my favorites, of course. Um, our guests, as you know, we love to dive into their background stories, their career highs and lows, uh, unique perspectives and the future of our industry. And I have to say, it's been uh, really exciting to uh, getting to know my next guest. Uh, Jeff Barber, he's a partner and EVP of sales and business development at Prime Data Centers. You're going to hear Prime a heck of a lot these days if you haven't already. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jeff and his insights, I'm just excited. Welcome, welcome, Jeff. Yeah, Jamie and Evan, I'm looking forward to, maybe I'll skip my next coffee and get some of that, you know, a few thousand Evan crypto coins here. Now we're, now we're talking. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, so Jeff, in my, in my due diligence, uh, which is basically Googling you. Um, <laughs> I, None of it's true. None of it's uh, true. Well, you know, I was fascinated. I, I recently, I saw a recent video you did where you're discussing 2021 trends and the mm-hmm. wholesale data center leasing space. So turnkey versus powered shell, single tenant versus multi-tenant, hybrid versus cloud, on-prem, cost okay. consideration, yeah. investor profile, sustainability. Can you summarize that conversation in 15 seconds? <laughs> Absolutely not. But our, our marketing group is doing a great job of the key words, obviously. Yeah, I was going to you, say, you hit, I you hit about every one of them. Right? You're going to have to add this into all no, of them. You know, no, no hashtags needed, apparently. No, we're, we're good. No, I can't do it in 15 seconds, but we could certainly choose one of those topics and dive into it. Absolutely. Great. Well, hopefully we'll get some insight through the course of this show. But in all seriousness, you, you've had a tremendous amount of success. And looking at your background and bio, it looks like partnerships might may be the key to your success and your team's success at many levels. So mm-hmm. what, tell us about Prime Data Centers and your unique approach to partnering. Sure. So Prime, we are what you would call wholesale co-location. We're, we're builders, we're developers of data center space. So if you think of the traditional retail co-location world, 
as an example, that would actually be my customer typically. Either retail colo, such as Six Terra or Cologix or, or any of the retail colo partners, um, or large enterprises. So it, we can get into that a little bit down the road here, but you know, not not every workload and not every enterprise is cloud appropriate, as an example. So the hybrid approach is still extremely popular. How does that fit into our, our partnership philosophy? Prime is not a, a REIT, okay? We're not a real estate investment trust. We're a private group, extremely well-funded with, with some additional announcements coming in the next few weeks on that, on that front as well. So we're able to be extremely flexible. So let's say for instance, an enterprise customer would like a 10 megawatt facility. You know, they, 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 they want to get out of real estate. They don't want to manage their own facility any longer. They want, to, but they still want the upside of the real estate and they want the security of a dedicated data center floor, not multi-tenanted. Prime will actually enter into a joint venture with that company where they're paying themselves rent and they're, they, they're participating in the real estate upside, the appreciation of the asset. We also are very active in uh, sale leasebacks. So a, a, a company that may not be in the facilities world, maybe they want to focus on their core competency. We'll buy that asset. We'll manage that asset. We'll improve it if needed. And they can get out of the, out of the facilities world and hand it over to us. Uh, that's just a couple of small examples. We're also making some announcements in the next couple of weeks where we're, for instance, building powered shells and build to suit facilities in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, you know, I think we're going to talk about Santa Clara in a little bit, but that's a perfect example where a, a tenant will come to us. We have the land. We're going to build them a, a, a perfectly suited, customized data center to their every need. We can do all of that because, again, we are private. We don't have the same restrictions as a typical REIT would have, as an example. So we, we call it partnership as a service. Come to us with what you're looking for. Well, most likely we can make it work, whether that's ground up development, sale lease back, powered shell, you know, you name it. All right. So we have a lot of, a lot of global experience in that, in that realm as well. Yeah. And another great example of this uh, is a, a recent headline I was reading uh, from Prime. Um, you did a, a built to suit lease. There we go. Um, yeah. And this was a publicly traded global enterprise uh, up in Sacramento at your McClellan yep. Park campus. Could you tell us more there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, McClellan Park uh, is a former Air Force base and uh, Prime built a, at the time, designed and built a six megawatt um, data center, just white space. We recently leased that entire facility uh, but in addition to the six megawatt, the tenant had us add another two megawatt. So at that particular facility, we own our own substation. We have a 50 megawatt substation on site and we had all of the permitting in place. Uh, so we could, we could expand that from a six megawatt facility to an eight megawatt facility in, in record time. It is a single tenant. It is a private enterprise, although they're publicly traded. This is not a, uh, this is not a co-location provider. This is, a, this is a household name. It's a perfect example of where uh, hybrid is going. This, this particular tenant still has a vast majority of their compute and storage infrastructure under their own control. They of course have some workloads that go to the cloud, but again, not all workloads are appropriate. This customer doesn't wanna risk it. So yeah, it's, a, it's been a great project. We have three more buildings planned on that same campus. Um, again, we own our own substation. So, we can uh, we can we can raise the building and we can power it and all the permitting's in place so it's a great project mm -hmm. critical for california right absolutely yeah it's uh, uh it is a you know this is the digital infrastructure that that drives the economy and this particular tenant is a very important part of that uh digital infrastructure right sacramento into itself uh is an excellent location for not only primary compute and storage but backup and disaster recovery we could talk about that a little bit later but essentially, uh, we're, we're very close to the San Francisco Bay Area from a telecommunications perspective, approximately 90 miles, 100 miles. So there's not a lot of latency with your workloads, but we don't shake when there's an earthquake. We're not on a fault line. We're on a completely separate plate. We don't have earthquakes. We don't have floods where our location is. We're not on the coastline. So many enterprises actually replicate a tremendous amount of data to Sacramento. It's, it's very safe. It's very quick, massive infrastructure. Yeah, so it's a great campus, McClellan Park campus. You should check it out. It's a good spot. 
Yeah, I was actually checking it out online as you're speaking. And by the way, beautiful architecture, beautiful design of your buildings, just as a, a hat you. tip uh, b beyond what's inside the building. Re really well done. So Thank looking you. at, you know, the enterprise today, you know, we see this tremendous push to the edge uh, involving all as facets of IT and, and telecom. Um, so, how, but how does an enterprise sort of balance that need for centralized management, cl being close to the edge for user experience, you know, at the same time, you know, providing for quality of service and optimization? Like, how do you manage that central, central versus decentralized challenge? Yeah, if uh, Evan, if I could answer that easily, I'd be. I'd be living on my own island in Hawaii right now. <laughs> like, but, uh, like Larry, Larry. Oh, yeah, like Larry, Larry, like my bud Larry. Yes, yeah, great company. I used to work for Oracle. Um, yeah, it's a great question. The answer is it's not easy. It's uh, it's fluid, and enter every enterprise is different, and every workload is different. So, you mentioned edge computing as an example, or moving content closer to the edge. That you know that's very important for. Um, very important for user experience, for pushing rich media, videos, pictures, what have you, uh, beautiful podcasts like this one. Um, you want that closer to the edge for, for multiple reasons. Um, there are other workloads such as relational databases, since we're talking about Larry, that uh, need to be more centralized. They, they don't do well with latency, right? So the, the customer, the, the tenant, the enterprise, whatever we wish to call them, they need to truly, first and foremost, understand the nature of their data. Okay, am I latency sensitive? Is my content sensitive? Do I have intellectual property risk? Do I want to put this in a multi-tenant environment? Do I want to put this on an AWS or an Azure or a Google Cloud? Um, can my workloads handle that latency that, that's, that's inherent with uh, multi-tenant environments, right? So that's an incredibly complex question. Um, every enterprise struggles with it. That's you know kind of what led to our, our theme of partnership as a service. There is not one size fits all. In fact, in a, in a large company, even a medium sized company, you're going to have all of those examples in the enterprise. You will have file systems and you will have rich media and you will have relational databases and they all need to be treated differently, right? So it's a, it's a tough one. I wish I had an easy answer for you, Evan, but uh, it's not so easy. It's, it's not easy and um... And for sure, uh, getting to the edge, uh, knowing the right, the right balance between what, what we should put in the cloud, uh, but also top of mind these days in our, our virtual roundtable uh, yesterday, uh, was, this was also a topic, um, disaster recovery and business continuity. It's now sure. that summer, it's, <laughs> it's that time where, yeah. uh, yeah. where Mother Nature gets tough. Um, but, you know, also we talked about California um, and, uh, you know, it's it, earthquakes and even power grids. Um, so tell me, what are some of the pitfalls that you've seen over the years in terms of disaster recovery and business continuity strategies? Where, mm -hmm. You know, what's Prime's uh, strategy there and, and how does it align with your with your DR plans, your, your locations across California, for example? Yeah, great. Great question there. That's a that's a deep topic, and we we touched on it just a little bit. First and foremost, you know, to the IT group, understand your workload. Uh, what is the data that you need to replicate? Um, understand the inter interdependencies of that data. So, for instance, you can protect your accounting data. That's great, but if you don't protect the way in which you report to the street, as an example, the the accounting data does you no good. So you have to understand the interdependencies between your data. Um, location and proximity is, is critical. You know, having um, a data center that's that's 50 miles from your primary data center as a backup and a target, that's a great strategy unless it's on the same coastline or on the same fault line, right? So think about what direction your data is going. Um, think about things like, can my employees get to that site if they need to? The critical employees is there airport infrastructure if airports are closed down is there road and rail infrastructure so all of those um considerations enter into where prime chooses to invest uh that was a no pun intended a primary driver to to choosing mcclellan as an example in sacramento when when you replicate data many times you're worried about the latency related to the speed of light going through that fiber so 
the closer the better, but be far enough away to protect yourself. Sacramento has massive infrastructure, employees, roads, rail. Um, so even if the airports are shut down, if you're if you're a San Francisco Bay Area client or company, you want to get your data to a safe location. Sacramento is absolutely perfect. You can be there in a couple of hours. Okay, you're not relying on on other infrastructure. So Prime looks at that very closely. Uh, for instance, we will be connecting our Sacramento location to our Santa Clara locations. Um, and I, I say that plural intentionally. So we, there, one is public and one is not yet. Um, that'll be coming out soon. So yeah, it's it's proximity to your core data. It's the stability of that environment, the availability of, of, of power, obviously, and the availability of connectivity. Those are the primary drivers and understand your data. And then because this is a topic near and dear to my heart, I'm gonna keep talking. First and foremost, if you have a disaster recovery plan, you have to test it. Yeah. Don't, just, don't just leave it on the desk and collecting dust. Test it quarterly, test it monthly, partial failovers, full failovers. You, you need to exercise that machine. That would be my top piece of advice. So true. Great advice that is. I'm actually looking at your LinkedIn pro, uh, profile, Jeff Barber, and you have some amazing pictures of projects underway. You know, anyone who's interested in, uh, you know, critical power engineering and civil engineering construction should check them out. They're really impressive. And you recently announced a development of a nine megawatt facility in mm -hmm. Santa Clara. So tell us yes. about that project. Yeah. So San Francisco Bay Area, obviously the tech hub of the of the world. Um, what it is, though, is, is also very short on power. So this facility is is locked down. We're starting construction within the next two weeks. Uh, you can check out our website, primedatacenters.com. That's at 111 Comstock is the address. Um, so, but that facility is now fully leased. I, uh, I can't give you the tenant name yet, uh, but we did pre-lease the entire building. It's, a, it's an extremely large world-class leader in the co-location space. Um, that'll be public in about a week or two. We'll do a couple joint press releases and I'll be sure to get you uh, an immediate copy of that. So yeah, we're very excited about that. And we're, uh, we're working on a couple of other properties in San Francisco Bay Area that also have power rights already locked down. That's a critical consideration. You, you can't, you can own the dirt, but if you can't get power, that's a tough one. Oh my goodness. I, yeah. I want to bet, I think I know, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it on who it is. I well, think I know who it is. <laughs> you know what we could do, Jamie? We're going to bet Evan's cryptocurrency. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will bet you a billion Evan coins. <laughs> and i will match it which is uh that'll be worth cool. about 27 dollars. so yeah wow. that's fine. Oh, we're talking now we're talking heavy oh, money man. here <laughs> getting intense i'm getting nervous okay. well you know this is um uh colo facilities data centers um hyperscalers it's it's a, an amazing amazing world ever expanding uh there's no shortage of data for sure and consumption of that uh so what are some contributing factors to hyperscalers growth and how does that enable uh, Prime uh, from uh, to help those hyperscalers from say like an equity and tax advantage standpoint? Wow, great, great question. Um, I hate to say the answer is it depends, but the answer is it depends. We actually have the world's, one of the world's largest hyperscalers as a tenant um, in one of our Bay Area facilities. Uh, so obviously, the, the, the growth of data is, is exponential, continues to be exponential. The, the advent of, of, of 5G networks and getting, getting your content, as we mentioned earlier, closer to the edge. In fact, I personally believe it will be edge everywhere. <laughs> You're gonna see many, many, many 10 or 15 megawatt edge locations, which you know 10 years ago, that would have been a massive data center. Now it's just run of the mill, you know, somewhat small, yeah. Um, yeah, Prime does work uh, with the hyperscalers. We, as a, as a very specific example, uh, we have a, a powered shell where we stand up the building, we get utilities to the building. That hyperscaler comes in and does their does their standard power and cooling inside the building, the distribution units and, and generators and things like that. Um, that's a great business model for us. We we have it down to a science. We have great developers. So those uh, those tenants 
tend to be very locked down into standardization. They have a design, it's very efficient for them. If you look at a Facebook or you look at a, at a Twitter or even like an AWS, if we're talking uh, the, you know, cloud providers, um, they're very specific in how they want the interior of their buildings to, to work and function and cool and, and power. So yeah, it's, it's front of our mind. Obviously those are the largest tenants uh, in the world. There are, there are places in the world where Prime is right now securing uh, rights to build, uh, specifically in Europe. Um, some of the most, um, I would say, hungry locations for data centers, Prime has already secured a couple of those. So you'll be hearing more about that in the next, I would say, three to six months. We'll do some announcements there as well. Exciting. Yeah. So let's shift gears to uh, who is Jeff Barber? Just looking at your LinkedIn profile. Uh-oh. You started off at uh, a company as a DEC VAC system admin. So you're wow. basically as old as time. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and is that really on there, Evan? I mean, it must be on there because it's true, but that is, uh, <laughs> I need to go edit that. I need to make myself look less than 100. <laughs> Somehow. And you were supporting 14,000 lottery terminal devices. So what could yes. go wrong, right? What could, what could go wrong? Plenty, yes. <laughs> I, I bet. And then you rose through the ranks of, of tech companies like HP and Dell EMC and Oracle and others. So really fascinating mm -hmm. career. You, you know, what are some of the takeaways from your career that help you turn Prime into one of the fastest growing turnkey data center you know, development companies out there? Yeah, you know, yeah, great question. And and I'm definitely making a note to go update LinkedIn or start, <laughs> start telling different lies. Um, you know, it's it's interesting, Evan. I, I reflect back on that particular job you brought up. I was what they would call a, a tape monkey um, for the California State Lottery. So yeah, working on, working on deck back systems and concurrent mainframes and tandem mainframes, if there's anyone old enough out there to remember that stuff. Um, it taught me a tremendous amount about how to manage a technical environment, uh, the importance of a data center. Uh, we're going back here, as you can see, a very, very long time we're talking about. Uh, I did, uh, you know, from there, from the California lottery, I, I went to the tech side. Like you said, Hewlett Packard, uh, you know, a very long time ago. The, the bulk of my career was spent at EMC, um, managing global accounts for them. It was interesting. When I began talking to Prime, um, I was speaking with them from a strictly uh, cons consultative perspective. They, they had hired me as a consultant to help them stand up a sales organization, help them stand up Salesforce automation, um, get, bring a little marketing bend uh, to the company. These are all real estate professionals, the, the other folks at Prime. As we worked together though, um, our, our CEO, Nicholas Log, I think he saw very quickly that the buyers have shifted. The tenants are no longer just the real estate folks within the enterprise. They're, they're typically the chief investment or the ch chief uh, information officer or the CISO, the security officer. Um, so they brought me on board as a partner and as, a, as an employee because I speak that language. Um, I actually don't speak real estate, but we have people, our other leadership is all real estate. So it's a great, great team. The, uh, there's, there's been a massive shift like the people I deal with every day from a tenant perspective, they're not real estate folks. They, they work in IT. They're storage and server professionals and network professionals. So um, that, that's probably the greatest takeaway is that there's a buyer shift here. Uh, and Prime you know, has addressed that, uh, not only with myself, but with some, with some new hires coming on board. Uh, these are tech professionals, not just real estate folks. Now, I love when you say there is a buyer shift. It, it's so true. Um, there's also been perhaps, and, and you were alluding to this earlier, a, a shift in, in uh, what are the, the top data center markets, you know, locations shifted, uh, obviously yeah. getting to the edge, uh, a, big, yeah. uh, a big push for that. Uh, so what are some of the top data center markets that Prime is now looking at? Can I go back to? Yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, good, good question. <laughs> um, you know, you're, you're right. The, the expansion of the edge uh, is, is, is unavoidable and, and, and very exciting, but there, there are still um, some, some core locations, right? Virginia, Oregon, Los Angeles, San Francisco Bay Area. That tends to follow the connectivity. So if you, if you look at the concentration of the connectivity 
either across the Atlantic or Pacific or internal to the US, it, that's where we're looking. Now, that's a little too broad for, to answer your question. Specifically, we are um, securing properties, you know, let's say in the Chicago area, as an example. Um, we're, we're very much looking at uh, some properties in Texas, very closely, I should say. Um, also, traditional markets such as Southern California. Mm -hmm. right? So the, the world is not becoming less connected. Let's put it that way. It's becoming more connected, right? And uh, again, the, we're seeing tremendous growth in our particular real estate vertical, uh, but there are a couple limiting factors there, such as power, such as securing permits, such as connectivity. You know, lots of people say, well, why don't you just go build a data center wherever the, the land and the power are the cheapest? That, that's great, but I, I can't fill a room full of servers and not have any way to speak to the world because I don't have connectivity. It, you have to get it out there, right? So it's symbiotic. It, it needs to... It needs to it needs to follow each other, and that's that's where we're looking. I mentioned Europe, um, Germany. As it, you know, be specific is is a growing market. You'll see more there uh, very soon, and uh, yeah, you'll see quite a few announcements coming out from us in the next six months. I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I bet. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's switch gears to our rapid fire sections, where we uh, you know have a a few uh -oh. rapid fire questions, and we try to embarrass you. So. <laughs> Just Let's, don't ask me uh, about deck deck back systems, please. Don't ask me about <laughs> and, and things like deck net. <laughs> oh, we have much better questions in mind. Thank you. So Thank you. We'll, we'll start off. We'll treat you gently to start. So we're uh, we're all getting back to the road in many ways and traveling mm -hmm. again. Yep. What's your favorite place to travel to globally? Globally, wow, yeah. When I was with EMC, I uh, I spent a lot of time in the air. My favorite, that's a great, that's a great question. The, I'm gonna give you the first one that comes to mind and it's its gonna be Dublin, Ireland. Oh, I, I love it, I love the people. They love to argue like I do, but they could still split a beer and not be too angry. They love to debate and talk politics and not get not get violent. And uh, they're just a great, great people. It's a, a beautiful city. Absolutely. I agree. I, I once spent 11 hours in a pub in Dublin, not, not even drunk. Just it was amazing. It was just uh, love, that's, love that's, that just, that's disappointing. Not even drunk. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I spent a week there one night. Yeah, I like to say. <laughs> <laughs> you got to make sure that there's there's enough blood in your alcohol system. So it's you know, yeah, so definitely. I love Ireland. Absolutely. All right. What's next? That's an easy one. I know. Well, mine's mine's more industry. You know, I'm a, my my data center geek self. What's your number one piece of industry advice for us? Number one piece of industry advice. Well, if we're going to stick with the data center theme right now, we kind of touched on it. Um, understand your buyer. It's kind of sales one on one. You know, who are you selling to, and what are their what's driving their wants and needs, and and uh, and, and and security and all of the above. Uh, understand the IT buyer. Like I said, I I can't overemphasize how that shift has taken place very quickly where we're not dealing with brokers you know we're willing to uh, we, we love brokers but these enterprises typically the chief uh, information officer is is making the decision yep. you know yep so people talk about leaving california or moving their company out of california which which i think is nuts because california is like the most beautiful place in the world from the north to the south What's what's your favorite as a as a native? What's your favorite beach in in California and why? Yeah, it's a great California is a great state and it's a very large state. So I'm actually hours from the beach. So everyone thinks that I surf, but I live in Sacramento, California. Um, so I surf on on a couple of lakes. I do. Um, <laughs> the uh, my favorite beach is definitely La Jolla, out down in San Diego. La Jolla Good is a beautiful town, beautiful people just absolutely idyllic uh it, it's gorgeous so that's another easy one you guys are going easy on me i like it yeah i'm, I'm looking out right now at laguna beach and um, uh, i gotta say this one this one's pretty good too <laughs> ah laguna beach yeah that's yeah yeah i uh, spent a lot of time down there by balboa island so not too far yeah. from you there yeah. yeah 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 i love it yep uh okay favorite place to dine Favorite place to dine? Well, my favorite place to dine actually is not in California, but almost. It's uh, we're blessed with this location. I'm about 
70 minutes from Lake Tahoe where I live. So I would say the Lone Eagle Grill in uh, Incline Village, Lake Tahoe. You're overlooking the lake. You've got snow-capped mountains. You've got great food. And there's a casino next door. So I have all my favorite things in, in <laughs> one little location. Yes, that's it. Let's go. That's making yeah. my heart ache, that, yeah. that description. So I see as well, you're a volunteer, uh, one at Sacramento Children's Home and I another have. project, Linus, uh, that makes yeah. blankets for needy children. That, that sounds wonderful. Like what, what, what are those two uh, activities about? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, we... Uh, Project Linus is a great one where, you know, children who, and sometimes very, very small children, they, these, these receiving homes need, need blankets. And it's something you could do with your kids. You know, essentially you, you, you get the, you get the material and there's a way you can, you can cut the edge and, and not each of the edges. So you create a beautiful little blanket for those folks. My children and I have done that several times. And uh, yeah, unfortunately uh, there are a lot of kids, um, who need uh, who need good homes, and some of those kids are very very small. So whenever yeah. whenever possible, uh, we like to, to to volunteer at the the Sacramento Children's Home and Receiving Home, and you know do what we can. It it it, it pulls at your heart. It takes a special kind of person who can do that. Um, I, I it has a huge impact on me. I'd like to say it was all positive, but sometimes it makes me a little bit sad. Um, but yeah, we they always need volunteers. So please look them up and see what you can do. Wow. Wonderful. That's mm -hmm. amazing. Well, that, I gotta say, I mean, should we end there? Because I feel like my, my next question just isn't. Yeah, as pro as. probably. <laughs> well, what is it? No, is no. it about cryptocurrency? Or we, what are we talking about? <laughs> it was pretty, pretty meaningless <laughs> after that uh, I know. Uh, <laughs> comment. We can edit that <laughs> out. We'll edit out the sad parts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we'll just add a background violin playing, Jeff. So we'll, no, we'll have no, that. No. But, but in all seriousness, thank you for joining us, Jeff. It was really eye-opening discussion. I learned a lot about the, the new world of the data center business that's just radically different from the data center world even two, three, five years ago. So we'll yeah. be looking to you for, for news updates and insights. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be thrilled to do this again. And I think uh, you know next time we'll talk about some of the trends towards green energy, right? I mean, data centers are tremendous consumers of power and it matters where that power is coming from. So. I think yeah. that'd be a good good follow up topic. Let's do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna book it. So, guys, uh, put that in your calendar. Next one coming up when we talk with Jeff will be on green energy. I uh, like Thank it. Thank you, Jeff, so much. We so appreciate your insights. You're really changing yeah. our, our industry, and we, we appreciate all you do, uh, you and your Prom team. Oh, thank you, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Evan. Uh, please check us out at jsa.net slash podcast for more uh, upcoming data movers episodes. We release every other week on Wednesday mornings and there's other JSA podcast series there as well. And be sure to follow us on, on Twitter at Jay Scotto, Evan Kerstell and uh, Clubhouse. We got we to join the Clubhouse party, Jamie. So uh, that's another thing we're on our plates. We got to do oh, that. Someone send me an invite. We will. I, no one's invited me. I feel uh, left out. Oh. Consider it done. Consider All it done. Right. I'm in. Uh, invite. Clubhouse. <laughs> Writing it down on my list here. Right? I have friends. I have friends. Yes. And always, guys out there, stay safe and happy networking. <laughs>